Hi, I'm Catherine Fulton from the Reykjavik Grapevine, and we're here with Hauskoli Eastland Professor of Volcanology and Petrology, Dr. Thorvaldur Thorlerson. Thorvaldur, thank you so much for joining us again today and taking the time to answer some questions. You're welcome. Uh, when we last spoke to you on November 8th, uh, the Blue Lagoon was still open, the town of Grindavik wasn't evacuated yet, and you were telling us what was happening underground. Uh, a lot has happened since then. 3,700 people have been evacuated, Blue Lagoon's closed, and there's a 15 kilometer long magma intrusion. Possibly. Possibly underground. Well, that's why we come to you. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us, just in broad strokes, what has happened since we last spoke and what the situation is now? So basically, what what happened on you know there was a, a fairly large and abrupt event on Friday on the tenth of November, and what happened then is what we had been talking about is that you know we had the magma flowing in and it's building up pressure, and uh, on Friday the rock which surrounding that that magma storage zone failed called the crack that propagated underneath Grindavik and, uh, you know, into the shallow sea south of the town. Mm -hmm. The magma flowed out of the storage zone into the crack and sort of followed that for some distance. This happened extremely fast. So we're talking, you know, the rate of what things are happening is, is uh, uh, minutes to maybe to an hour and it, it, it is propagating uh, uh, seven or eight kilometers. So, okay. so this is, you know, moving really, really fast. Quite a big extension. So tens of centimeters, just basically widening of the country. There, mm -hmm. uh, parts of the of, of the town moving east and parts of the town moving west, mm -hmm. and the middle dropped down in about a meter. Have we seen activity like that in the past three eruptions that have taken place? No, we have not not seen that in in, in, the, in the past. We've seen it in previous eruptions, but not the three ones in Faradarsjall, and that did not form what we call a graben or mm -hmm. a subsidence basin like, like this one did. And uh, it's quite wide, it, you know, it's a, a almost two kilometers in total width. Okay. Uh, it continues to actually widen and subside, even though now the rates have reduced significantly. But uh, uh, some parts of the, of the, of the town, like I said, for, you know, fell a meter, others 30, 40 centimeters. Mm. Uh, and, and people that were in the town uh, uh, at the time, they felt, of course, the earthquakes that are associated with all this fracturing and, and, and displacement of, of, of basically bedrock. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some of them were described this to me. They said they had surface waves, which was sort of rolling them around. Mm -hmm. But then every now and then there was like the, the ground was taken out from underneath the feet and they just had a free fall. Okay. And this was sort of happening over and over again. And mm -hmm. they had earthquakes of magnitude up to 5.2 right under the town. So, it, you know, these earthquakes are not coming from there or there. They're coming from there. Right. And that was the, uh, the strange movement that a lot of people felt. And, and of course, there's a, a significant damage to the town of Grindel because of this all this faulting. And, uh, you know, hot water pipes are broken sewage is broken in, in many places, electricity uh, uh, damaged in other places, and, and, and lots of houses uh, severely damaged. And uh, even houses which are not damaged, they may be on a block that actually dropped down one meter, and there's nothing to say that it actually dropped down, you know. Evenly, evenly. yeah. It may have tilted, right. so your house might be still intact, but it might be tilting you know, X centimeters to mm -hmm. <laughs> some direction. So all of these things are going to be uh, uh, revealed basically when this this event is over. And but they also will be part of the things that need to need to do fix mm -hmm. when they recover things or start well, recovering. Some some of our reader questions are about whether or not people can move back to Grindavik. But first, focusing on what's the latest news now that I've seen, yep. uh, where the ground is rising quite a bit around Svartengi power plant, which is the power plant right beside the Blue Lagoon. What's going on there? Well, exactly the same thing as was happening before the 10th of November. 
the Swart Tank area and then the region there and, and just sort of north of, of, of Thorbjörn, the, the mountain Thorbjörn, it's rising. Mm-hmm. And which means that magma has been is flowing into that shallow storage, magma storage zone at sort of four to six kilometers depth you now. And, uh, and it's lifting up the land just to make space for itself. And it's doing that at the rate it's two to three times faster than it was before the 10th of November. Okay, so what does that, what does that, that mean? That, that means that there's more magma coming in. It's coming in faster now mm-hmm. than it did before. And possibly, uh, you know, two to three times faster or even more. And and uh, uh, because you know, now you have all these cracks you can fill as well, mm-hmm. and, and magma can flow in that. So the estimate uh, the numbers in terms of how much magma is coming up from you know the deeper storage zone is on the order of 50 cubic meters per second. Before the 10th of uh, November, it was five to seven cubic meters per second. Okay. Uh, so does this raising of land in the past few days indicate to you that an eruption may be starting sooner than later? It, it could lead to an eruption, and, and, and uh, uh, there's another way of looking at this is that because of this faster rate, which is about 14 to 15 millimeters per day, mm. uh, this area will reach the same height as it had before 10th of November, uh, sort of a, uh, right around 25th to maybe 30th of November. Now, and that means also that, you know, the internal pressure in the system may be the same at that point mm-hmm. and and uh, uh, then the risk of having an eruption or even repeat of 10th of November increases so that's p- possible uh, both of those things are possible uh, um, sort of come towards the end of end of November okay uh, so that's that's the situation and uh, we cannot rule out eruption we cannot rule out the repeat of 10th of November and uh, we cannot rule out that this thing may just taper away and not do anything. Okay. Before we get into the reader questions, uh, I wanted to address the safety outside of the general area of Grindavik stretching to the Blue Lagoon and Svartsengi power plant, because there's been a lot of misinformation online and a lot of people fearful that all of Iceland is not safe because of what's been going on. Uh, the safety level here in the capital, Reykjavik, where we are now, do we have anything to worry about? No, not a thing. If what we are looking at right now is events that are almost completely confined to Grindavik and, and Svartsengi, mm-hmm. and, and those are mostly movement along faults, and there are some earthquakes in there, yes, you can feel the earthquakes some dis- X distance from from the, this area, but the earthquake magnitude or the size of the earthquake can steadily going down now mm-hmm. most of them are below two magnitude so you know you're not going to even feel yeah we, have, we haven't been feeling them no. here in Reykjavik yeah. no no and not even if you're on the Reykjavik mm-hmm. uh, bright and, and driving towards Reykjavik or so that's that's kind of calmed down a lot um, if we have an eruption uh, we could have some lava fountains and lava flows that also would be largely confined to the, the, this area where you have the current arrest. Uh, we could have a little bit of, of tephra fall, but that would be very minor and and uh, not really be dispersed that far away from, from the eruptive source. A little bit of pollution, which could cause some inconvenience uh, for some people. But in general, Iceland is unaffected by this, except for mm-hmm. this part of stretch of land that goes from Grindavik to, to Svartsengi and um, emotionally, Iceland is, is is far more affected oh, than, no, than, 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 than physically. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, uh, you can travel around Iceland and you're perfectly safe. Uh, you can stay in Reykjavik or Keflavik Airport. Uh, the Keflavik Airport is not going to close because of these events. Mm-hmm. So, it's, uh, it's safe to travel to Iceland. The, the influencers can take note of that. No more, no more fear mongering. We're, a... we're not going to have repeat of, of AF at the Yoga 2010. We're not going to have an eruption that will resemble that. No. Okay. We and like I said, we can have, we could have some eruption offshore in 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 the sea, mm-hmm. 
that would be a last producing eruption and it would probably produce eruption column that could reach to heights of six to eight kilometers, produce a mass foam even in, in, in Reykjavik. But that would be more of an inconvenience than, than, than an impact. All right. Okay. Are you ready for some viewer questions? Sure. Yeah? Okay. And bear with me with uh, some of these YouTube handles. But Tony the Tiger, XG9CR, <laughs> asks, how come all the vo volcanoes are popping? <laughs> well, they're not, they're not all popping, is the answer. Mm -hmm. Now, the Reykjanes Peninsula uh, has been locked in the news, and, and a lot has been happening on the Reykjanes Peninsula since 2021, mm -hmm. even 2019, when the, these things sort of started, but underground. And... Uh, Maybe people notice that much more because it's been quiet. Before 2021, we had no eruption for 781 years. Mm. And, and no volcanic activity at all. And that's the nature of the Reykjanes Peninsula. It sort of stays quiet for 600 to 1,000 years, at least vulcan volcanically. And then it just turns on. And for the next three, four hundred years, it will be erupting here and there, and you know, playing its 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 game in terms of producing lava flows and and lava fountains and and a, and a bit of a nuisance for everyone around mm -hmm. with with a little bit of pollution and asphalt. And it will it will do this for the next sort of three, four hundred years or so. Okay. So it just started. Okay. And. Then it will, you know, it will go quiet, and they, probably areas that, like like the Faradarsfjall and Grindavik, which start very early in this eruption period, mm -hmm. uh, the activity there could be over now or tomorrow, or it could take another few years or even a decade for it to complete. Mm -hmm. But when it's done, it's not going to do anything for another six hundred to a thousand years. Okay, and when we spoke in July, you said that these periods of activity they're called fires eruption periods are three to four hundred years long okay. feature many fires oh, okay and each fires features a series of eruption that erupt very closely in in, in time mm -hmm. so maybe a year or a few years between each event over a period of a, a decade or two or three decades so okay. that's that's what is fires Okay. And they're usually confined to one particular area or a volcanic lineament mm. while they're happening. So they, they will, all of these events will more or less be in the same place okay. for that period of time. And then they move to another volcanic lineament and repeat the process at some point in time. And when you do this maybe 10 times over the course of three to 400 years, and then it goes quiet again. Okay. Uh, Annie Mack, 42882 says, do you think there's a link between the current activity and climate change? I don't. I think this, what we're seeing now is purely the uh, uh, result of plate movement. Okay. So, and, and in Iceland, because we have the plate boundary goes across Iceland from the Reykjavik, you know, basically Reykjavik, which is the, the, the heel of, of the Reykjavik Peninsula. If you look mm -hmm. at the Reykjavik Peninsula, it looks kind of like a boot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the heel is actually the, where the mid-ocean rate comes to shore. And that's where the plate boundary comes to shore in Iceland. And then it co continues across the country all the way to the northeast to Skelvanti. And that's where it goes off into the, into the uh, uh, Arctic seas. Mm -hmm. And this plate boundary is moving. So the plates on either side of this boundary, they're moving one centimeter per year in opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So you, you basically you're splitting Iceland, and and uh, you heal the wound by putting magma in there and and making the land bigger in the process. And what's happening above ground, the glaciers melting or anything like that, doesn't have any impact on how quickly those plates are moving. Then no, okay, it's not. Gonna have that. They're melting very fast, but they're not changing the rate of plate movement. Okay. Maz3736 asks, what percentage of Iceland has lava underground? Hmm. 
good question. One hundred? No. <laughs> no. 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 That's, that's not an easy thing to answer because we have these like they have the plate boundary mm -hmm. and above the plate plate boundary we have all kind of stones which have a have a you know a width. So the plate boundary is not just a line. Mm -hmm. It actually is a a zone across the country which has a, a width of roughly between 25 and 50 kilometers. Okay. And where you have the plate boundary, that's where the magma, you know, comes up from very deep within the earth from the mantle, and it accumulates into storage zones, you know, initially at, at a deeper level in the crust. Mm -hmm. And and each of those storage zones, they, they can be, be quite large. They, they could be 100 kilometers long and a few kilometers thick, but they're not purely melt. So they're going to be have what we call crystal mush. Okay. So it's kind of like when you have your yogurt and you put uh, 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 a cornflakes in it, mm -hmm. it thickens, right? And you get all these pieces in, 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 in your yogurt. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what the magma is in the story zone. It's got all these pieces which we call crystals in them. Okay. And, and, uh, and, and so that portion of that is melt, portion of that is, is solid. And, some, and that melt sometimes can accumulate into larger bodies which then can pressurize its surroundings and, and, and continue migrating towards the surface into a new storage zone and then from that storage zone to maybe to the surface into an eruption. So relatively small portion of the, the, the crust underneath the volcanic belt mm -hmm. is actually melt. If I think it's gas, maybe not much more than 5%. Okay, that's probably a lot less than than people are estimating. Yes, when you're always talking about yeah. the volcanic activity here on this it, island, yeah, it's a large area, but on these things, five, ten percent or so at, at best. But okay, but that's plenty to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, from Facebook, Jesse Bauman asks, "How does a volcanic system form to be considered separate from others?" Iceland has 32 such systems. Do they ever cross over or join? This is a very good question, and uh, answering it is a bit problematic. Okay. Because we say this, you know, and some people say 32 active volcanic systems. I say 30 active volcanic systems. Okay. Some say even 33 active volcanic systems. All depends on you know, sort of a, the growing details of, of what how you define it or how you draw the lines on a map. Mm. Now, the easiest way to think of what kind of system is is, is, is that, you know, you have some form of a, a, a deeper magma source and that sort of a, is an identity and it's feeding magma into shallower storage zones which can form Strata volcanoes or, or big volcanoes above them, or feeding magma straight up to form an eruption. And, uh, however, identifying, you know, those identity, you know, the like, what is the exact size of the magma storage? Mm -hmm. How is it different from other magma storage? Mm -hmm. So you try to use the chemistry. In some cases, you can see, oh, there's a clear difference between, you know, composition of the magma comes up in this system versus that system and they're, they're clearly separate and it's easy. Yeah. But sometimes we have, like in Reykjanes, mm -hmm. we, people claim there's six volcanic systems. They all have the same magma composition. Mm. There's no difference be between the magmas that are coming up in this system or that system. They all follow on the same trend. So we can't use chemistry to differentiate between systems in the Reykjanes Peninsula. Then you go, okay, what about the fractures? So you, okay, so we have rifting events, they form fractures, and just like the crap and that we saw, etc. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there's a system, they must be clustered within individual systems. And uh, there are clusters in Reykjavik's Peninsula, but there are about three. The systems are thought to be six. Okay. So not even the fault patterns or the crack patterns, if you like, give a clear distinction of these volcanic systems. So it is kind of a understanding and how we define volcanic system is a bit fluid. Okay. And sometimes it actually works quite well, but in other cases it's more questionable and uh, even to the extent that you, you know you say, well, I don't think there are any volcanic systems in this particular region. And, uh, 
there are a number of scientists that actually have that view. Okay. So, and, and you know, well, well-respected scientists who actually hold that view for certain regions in Iceland, like, like the Reykjanes Peninsula, mm. and also the Western Volcanic Zone, which is a continuation of the Reykjanes Peninsula inland. Okay. So, it, you know, it's not that clear-cut. Yeah. And, and uh, um, so, take it with a pinch of salt. All right. Uh, Buffalo Rob Polo asks, do the scientists think it will be a similar eruption like the past three in the area or much larger? In terms of... And that's again, if there's... Yeah. If there's if an eruption, there, if, if there, that's if there, if what a, this comes to. If there is an eruption in the region of Svartsengi, like, for example, on Sundtukar, mm. Conro or, or the Itlarhaun Conro or the uh, uh, Eldwerp Conro, the style of the eruption that will come up is going to be similar to what we saw in front of us. So it, it will be a lava producing eruption. What we don't know, and we can't see uh, up front, is what the intensity is going to be. It, my guess would be that it would be significantly more intense than what we saw in, in Faradars, because those are unusually sort of a calm event. Mm-hmm. But it's, and primarily in the beginning of the event, so you might get, we might get fairly high lava fountains and and uh, fairly high discharge of how much material comes out per unit time, uh, and producing reasonably fast moving lava flows, at least for the you know first hours, maybe the first couple of days or so, and then it might taper off and come down. Mm-hmm. But it will be a lava producing eruption. It might be much bigger than what we saw in Farrakhan, but. For most part, it still will be fairly tourist-friendly event. Okay. Uh, David Johnson asks, historically, have long magma chambers, like we're seeing now to have formed, or supposedly to have formed in the region, uh, do they open up all the way along or along a single crater and that's enough to relieve the pressure? Depends. Okay. It depends on on, on the exact stress regime. Mm. In in the area and and how you how you fracture the crust, sometimes uh, uh, you can unzip the roof for the storage zone mm. along its entire length, and you can have magma rise up through a, a really sort of what we would call a big dike, mm. and and that dike could come up to the surface and form a very very long cone row. The longest cone rows in Iceland are sixty five kilometers long. And where are those? Those are in like in the in the area between Mirtasjökull and the Vatnajökull, and the Laki area, Elgjá, okay. and, and Veidiva. So it, up up in the highlands, but you know the, they are sixty five kilometers long mm-hmm. cone rows, and and uh, not saying necessarily all of that was active at the same time, but significant portion of that length probably erupted simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Um, Hollerhead 2014 15 was a relatively short fissure. It was about 1.8 kilometers long and it had a, a, a curtain of fire mm-hmm. along its entire length in the beginning. And then activity starts to concentrate on specific vents and they start to then deliver lava. On, and in, in the end, quite often the activity is really focused just on one vent and that's what is producing most of the, of the lava. And that's what you see after the event has stopped, you know, the most noticeable, you know, cones and events in eruption like this are those who were active for the longest because they're going to be biggest. Mm-hmm. The, the biggest cones do not equate the most powerful part of the fissure. They actually equate to where the activity uh, remained on for longest. Okay. Uh, Volcano 7965 asks if, if there are any significant similarities with the Krafla fires. There are, to, to some extent, in, in the sense that uh, uh, this is episodic. Mm. And, and, and so far it has been mostly seismic events and, 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 and also uh, uh, inflation or, or lifting up of the, of the surface. Mm-hmm. And that has been episodic. So you've have, we've had episodes of uplift and seismic activity associated with that 
and then that relaxes and falls down, and then another period. There's been five of those so far. This one that's ongoing is the fifth in four years. Okay. So that is actually quite similar to what people are observing at Krapla. Yeah. But, and of course, there is some extension in this area as well, but the whole overall tectonic situation is quite different in the Reykjanes Peninsula compared to the Krapla area. In the Krapla area, the plates are, are, are basically moving away from each other perpendicular to the orientation of the Krapla fissures and, and faults. Okay. So, that, you know, that, it's just pure extension. Mm -hmm. In the Reykjanes Peninsula, the uh, uh, plate boundary come at an angle but the, uh, uh, across the, uh, the peninsula, but that's sub parallel to the movement of the plate. So they're not quite parallel, okay. but almost. So the plates are doing this. Oh, all right. And because they're not quite parallel, then it's not, you not only slide, you open up a little bit, and that's how the mama gets up to the mm. surface. And uh, uh, so that is the difference. Mm -hmm. And that's all probably also why the, the, uh, the eruptions might be slightly different or behave slightly differently compared to the Krapla fires. But in terms of the overall nature of these, you know, these events, uh, both feature earthquakes, both features uh, extension mm -hmm. and formation of big faults and normal, you know, subsidence and etc. And also, if we have eruption in, in on the in the volcanic lineament, then we will have a very you know eruption that is of same style as Krapla, even mm -hmm. though it could be in detail in terms of intensity or size might be quite different. Okay. Um, this is maybe a weird one, but Heidi Smith asks, is it possible this eruption and earthquakes could drain the Blue Lagoon? Yes. Yeah? I thought that was just a weird question. How would it drain the Blue Lagoon? If, 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 they, if they form a crack right underneath the Blue Lagoon. Okay. Yeah, and you open up a crack where the Blue Lagoon is and all that water is going to be gone. All right. All right. No. We, we, were, we were joking in the office about someone coming along and pulling the bath plug and... Uh, well, the Earth can do that. Heidi, I'm sorry for doubting you. Apparently it wasn't such a silly question after all. <laughs> um, okay. Martin Sitzman, 8772, uh, asks what you think about the big wall that's being built around Svartengi Power Plant and the Blue Lagoon. I think it is a, 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 both a wise decision to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, and a good thing, um, probably because I'm one of those people that is in the working group that promoted the. Ah, so you're biased. Of course, I'm biased. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 in, in a in a more, sort of more broader sense, in terms of you know this kind of activity and and, and, and the future here in in, in on the Reykjanes Peninsula, this is the most popular area in Iceland. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going into a period that where this kind of event are going to be repeated. Yeah, we have a lot of really important infrastructures, and and uh, uh, I mean the Blue Lagoon is an important infrastructure for, for you know, from a tourism point of view. But the power plant is even more mm -hmm. important. Of course. So if we have to select between the Blue Lagoon and the power plant, I think we would probably select the power plant mm -hmm. because that is supports both electricity and hot water to. The uh, the whole community on the western side of the Reykjanes Peninsula is thirty thousand people. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of these infrastructures are important. The same with, with Grindavik, you know, the, the, what they built up there in terms of fishing industry and things like that. These are you know billions, hundreds of billions of kroner which have been invested in mm -hmm. in, in these these industries. And and it would be crazy for us not to spend a little bit of money try to protect them as much as we can. And, and divert, you know, hazardous lava flows or other things away from those uh, uh, really important infrastructures. So, I mean, if, if you think about it, building that wall, it sounds like a lot of money. I think it's like two billion Icelandic kroner. But mm. the investment in there is, goes on hundreds of billions. Mm. So, it, you know, it's like one, maybe half a percent of the total worth of the thing or even less. And how you're on, as you said, the, the team kind of advising mm. this. 
How do you decide where to build a wall if you can't pinpoint exactly where an eruption well, would we, begin? Well, we look at the most likely scenarios. So that's one thing that we, uh, uh, me and, and, and my colleague Arman Haskelson and, and Ingeborg Jonsdott, we've been working in the European projects for over eight years mm. to develop a methodology to actually undertake hazard assessment. So we, what we've done in that, we use what we know about the erupt, you know, eruption history, Regis Peninsula, where the location of vents, etc., etc., and to find out where are the most likely places where we're going to erupt mm. in the near future, when when things uh, uh, happen on the Regis Peninsula. Uh, based on what we've done, we have sort of a, what we call a susceptibility map, is eruptability map, if you like. Okay. And so, and we can say that you know the likelihood of an eruption, if you see seismic activity in this area, it's going to be here, here, and here, and here. And we mm. use that in our simulation. It is true that you know some uh, uh, vents are actually very close to the power plant. Mm -hmm. And th those are old vents. They could be reactivated, or the area right on could be reactivated. But if that happens, there's nothing we can do anyway. Mm. Now, if yeah, but it's more likely that the eruption will take place on a linear moment, which are outside of the area where the wall is protecting. Okay. And the wall was designed in such a way that it actually is on a ridge. So it beats the Blue Lagoon and the, and the power plant, Svartsenki, they sit in a basin. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, you know, as you go out of the basin, there's a ridge, and then the land uh, 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 slopes in the, away from that in the other direction. So the wall is built on top of the ridge. So try to prevent lava from coming into the in, into the Blue Lagoon Basin. Right, and what is the status of the wall now? It's actually coming out really quickly. So okay, I think they're um, almost finished all of the segments that we're doing. I think they're at least three meters high. Oh wow! Already and made out of what? What what is a lava-proof wall made out of? Lava. Made out of lava. Pieces of lava. Okay. It's it's actually pieces of lava from a, a, a close by gravel mine, okay. and added other material whenever that that is needed. You know, it's just how much material do you have? Okay. Some you know, some of those walls are basically basically piled up from the dirt around around the area. So, mm -hmm. and uh, and that that works. We know that because we did we did that in the uh, 2021 eruption and. The, you know, we pushed up walls and they were blocking the flow of lava mm -hmm. and uh, they would just took the pressure. They, they did not fail. Okay. But the lava just, <laughs> lava is not clever. Mm. It just jacked itself off and flowed over them. Oh, OK. So Oops. Let's hope that doesn't happen this time. <laughs> it, it probably will. <laughs> OK. But you see, the number of things, you know, walls like this, what we're trying to do is divert the lava in certain directions. Mm -hmm. now, if, we, if we get a really big eruption, we know that these things are not going to hold forever. Yeah. And But a lot of times, you know, they might breach the wall, but there might just be little strings of lava that go in and, mm. and, and the main flow, the main flow is in, in the other direction. So, and at least we could delay uh, uh, a lava coming over and then destroying everything, and that might also give us more time to actually salvage, okay. you know, important things that we might otherwise not be able to. Right. Uh, so you are advising on this wall, but Sophie Fernet asked on Facebook if scientists are consulted when making investment decisions like power plant locations. Uh, yeah, so I am in this infrastructure group. It's a, it's a large group that was mm -hmm. pointed by the, the civil defense. And uh, um, uh, we, of course, focus on kind of a protective measures. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we, you know, we should have been... I wish we'd have started earlier because then there would be more protective measures and, 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 and preventive measures than, than uh, what they are right now. There's a response. Mm. More, more than more than preventive things. When the, uh, towns are planning their neighborhoods for you know for construction and things like that, sometimes I think they do consult scientists or engineers or mm -hmm. or uh, specialists in in certain areas. 
Uh, they they do that for a number of things, of course, but in terms of natural hazard, in Iceland, not as often as this year. Okay. It, it's, it's the best answer, really. I mean, it has been done, mm-hmm. but it's not always done. And uh, we have, maybe because of relatively low level volcanic activity in the 20th century, mm. we have come, become a little bit complacent about you know, what volcanism and, and volcanic eruptions, you know, can do in terms of impact and, and, and how they can affect our lives. And I think we need to be more vigilant and think more about preventive measures, what we can do to minimize the impact of such events on society and also on our important infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel... Fender asks, is there an increased risk of explosive eruption considering the water at Svartengi and where the fissure reaches the sea? You mentioned before that if it were to erupt under the water, there could be ash plumes. So, Does that hold as well if it were to erupt where all the geothermal water is at Svartengi? I don't think so. And and, and, and actually, not everyone agrees with me on that. I don't think so. And that, the reason is because, you know, the geothermal water is quite hot. And the temperature difference between the magma and the water is much less than okay. it would be if it was surface water. And therefore, you're not going to have the same, uh, uh, say, explosive effect, even if you get, get into contact with that water. Um, and basically, because you just, you know, the... Exp- the amount of expansion of the steam is, is probably not going to be quite the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, w- another thing which is quite interesting, and this is just an observational thing, uh, we have really not seen any what we call flare magmatic eruptions, which are eruptions where you have explosive interaction between external water and hot magma, so basically the magma is thrusting the water into steam. Mm-hmm. And we don't have much evidence of such eruptions in areas where you have geothermal activity. Okay. And that's just an observational point. That's not, you know, and I suspect that has something to do with this thing that I mentioned earlier. That, you know, the, the temperatures. Diff- yeah, the yeah. temperature difference. Okay. But it um, hasn't really been investigated that closely. Okay. If it goes in the sea, we will have... Uh, uh, explosive interaction but it, 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 it when you have this thing happen at the surface the the magma that comes up is already fully expanded it's already fragmented mm. so and, and you, you can think of it as a because if you look at the the cluster for for, for uh, uh, from eruption like surce or or any other uh, free or magmatic uh, eruption in Iceland the clusters are highly vesicular. They're, you know, they're fully expanded. So you've exhaled all the gases out, you've already fragmented the magma, and, and it's already in a state of being a, a gas jet with particles in it. Okay. When it gets to the water. And what it does, it entrains the water into the, the jet. Mm. And what that hap- does is that it quenches, because you can't, in order to have explosive fewer coolant interaction or, or this, this sort of what people look at as, as explosive ferromagmatic uh, events, you have to have a fluid-fluid contact. So okay. You have to have magma and, and water, mm-hmm. and as the water comes into contact with the hot magma, it you know will st- flush into steam mm-hmm. and grow the steam film, you, uh, and you form a quenched layer here on, on, the, on the magma, and that slows down the heat transfer from here to there. Yeah. And, and then the steam film can't grow anymore because you can't transfer enough heat to actually generate more steam. And this sort of moves up like that. And it collapses down on that. And the water just breaks the magma. You expose more incandescent lava mm-hmm. and more glowing, you know, lava or magma surfaces generate more steam and you repeat the process and you repeat the process like that and in the end you get a big explosion. Okay. But in order to do that, you have to have this liquid-liquid contact. Right. Now, when when the magma is coming up to 
almost to the surface and is encountering the water, basically at the surface, whether it's under glacier mm. or, or in a, a lake or in the shallow seas, it's already fragmented, as I said earlier. It's already fully vesiculated, and when it vesiculates, just like in big explosions, you disintegrate it into particles, and those particles then are thro thrown out as a momentum jet up through the water column, and it grabs some water into it, they entrain it, draw it in, that flushes to steam, that quenches the particles, and you reduce the size of them. So basically what happened is sort of a, a fairly passive sort of quenched granulation of already granulated material. And you increase the amount of small particles in the material that is erupted, mm -hmm. which we call ash. Mm -hmm. So these are ash-based eruptions. Okay. And the, but the power of the event has not increased at all. It's the same as if it was erupting on land and producing lava fountains. Okay. So you haven't you haven't changed the intensity of the event. All you've done is changed the grain size. Yeah. Of the of, of, of the yeah, the size material. of the particles being and skewed up. Because they're okay. smaller, you can throw them further, and they can be carried further away from source. Okay. So that's why I also think these eruptions, even though they go in the sea, they're not going to be that dramatic of an event. It would, they will be spectacular, but they're not going to be anything that is going to destroy you know, large swath of land or communities. Mm -hmm. or it's not going to close the airspace or anything like that. Okay. Um, Mu Kao Pong One, okay. love, love the YouTube handles, uh, asks, if there's no eruption, how long would it take to be sure that the threat has passed and how would you know? Again, a very good question, and, and unfortunately... I'm probably thinking here of people returning yeah, to Grindavik. No, it's a very good question. Yeah. That's one which is really, really hard to answer. Number one, we don't know when this event is, is going to be over. Mm. We don't know whether it is going to erupt or whether it is going to, you know, not erupt and just die out. And like I said, we've had, you know, four other events like this since 2019, even though they didn't become as dramatic as this one and uh, what intense as this one. And we've had this sort of a cyclic behavior of, 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 of the, this volcanic lineament which is there and what is saying that it won't continue to do that for the next two or three or four or five years, mm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's the uncertainty. So, and we can't be sure, you know, even if this seismic activity dies out completely now, even if it erupts and it's a small eruption and and then it just stops. We can't say it's over. Mm -hmm. we, are, we can't be 100% sure. And we can't even tell you whether, you know, you're going to have another interruption like this next year or the year after that mm -hmm. or the year after that. That's the uncertainty of, of all this. And, and, and that's why we need to and uh, we are studying these kind of volcanic systems because you know, we need to learn more if we want to be able to, at some point in the in the future, predict eruptions. So right. we tell people like this is going to happen. This you know, this day is going to last until you know, fifty days later, and then you can you know go home and clean up. Mm. Uh, but we are not there yet, and we should not forget that meteorology began. Uh, a very long time ago, and then there was a, a, a systematic effort to do, to uh, undertake systematic weather observations in Europe from 1767 to 1797. There was 49 stations across Europe, uh, located across Europe. We took observ weather observations three times a day. They measured temperature, pressure, humidity, described the cloud con uh, sky conditions and mm -hmm. all that. And it's, it's a remarkable, you know, effort. And this is all compiled in, in, by the Meteorological Society of Mannheim, and they had, have catalogs of all these observations from all these different places. Oh, yeah. And the, the idea behind the whole thing was to be, be able to make a synoptic weather map and predict the weather. Mm. So how long did it take us to get to the point of being able to predict the weather with the reasonable reliability. That's almost 200 years later. Mm -hmm. 
it takes time. So on that scale then of that, for example, happening in the 1700s to 200, 300 yeah, years yeah, later. Yeah, when we have satellites, we could start to do reasonable weather forecasts, right? Where, where, on, where on that timeline would we be in terms, in terms of, of uh, volcanoes? predicting volcanoes? It's more difficult to uh, uh, predict volcanic eruption for one very simple reason. Mm -hmm. You can see the weather. Mm. <laughs> you can't see the magma when it's under, underground. So that's, that's, a, that's one of the big challenges. Systematic uh, sort of uh, volcanic, volcanology research, it didn't really kick in until sort of uh, close to the mid 20th century. I mean, there were some observations done before that, but they were more haphazard kind of a, mm. rather than, and, and so this mo the era of modern volcanology uh, didn't really kick in until right around 1970. Okay. And that's where, you know, people started to do more quantitative observations, not as descriptive as it was before, using uh, 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 the tools of both, you know, maths and physics and chemistry, modeling and, and, and all, all these things uh, and to understand volcanic eruptions. And that was... Uh, an incredible era in volcanology because it, you know it kind of revolutionized the uh, 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 the whole field. I mean, mm. And these are, include people like uh, George Walker, uh, Steve Sparks, Steve Self, Hans Ulrich Minke, uh, uh, Richard Fisher, and a number of others, uh, Lionel Wilson, uh, Colin Wilson. Bruce Houghton in, 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 in New Zealand. But this, this group of scientists came in and, and, and they basically turned volcanology into what it is today. Okay. Did, they, did that inspire you? Absolutely. Because you were studying in Hawaii in, in the, what, you graduated in 1990 or 91? I graduated in uh, 1984. Oh, okay. From Iceland, undergrad, and I went yeah. abroad. Did masters in Texas with yourself, okay, uh, and and uh, then then later on uh, with yourself and George Walker in in, in Hawaii, okay. Uh, absolutely, they inspired, but also Icelanders they inspired me. See, with Thora and so on, is, was a great inspiration as well. They, 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 they taught me here in in uh, uh, this university, and mm -hmm. it so happens I'm sitting in his position now. Yeah, uh, the position that he used to hold. Uh, Sigurd Steinthorsson, which is my predecessor in this position, he uh, also inspired me. Guðrún Larsen, which has uh, been a great mentor through, throughout the years. All of these people, yeah, are a big influence on, on me and my career. They, mm. And uh, if I wouldn't have met all these people, then I wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, back to the questions. Um, Sue's Dawn on YouTube asks, which of Iceland's volcanoes make you the most nervous? And then she says, I bet it's Katla, but I also bet you're too hardcore a scientist to be nervous about anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get nervous. I get nervous. Yeah, so Actually, which, which, which Katla, volcano makes Katla you most nervous? Katla does not make me that nervous. No? Okay. But what, the one that makes me most nervous is, is related to Katla, which is called Elgio. Okay. So large, really large fissure eruptions, like Elgia or the Lucky Fires in seven eighty three eighty four, mm. those are kind of events that I, I don't want to see, mm. because the consequences are are too dire. And uh, of course, we can also have very big, explosive eruptions, like we had in Nuremberg in thirteen sixty two, and uh, that. Uh, causes also concern, you know, because it, a big explosive eruption from a volcano like that can wipe out communities in, in, in a very, basically in an instant. And they mm. did so in 1362 and wiped out 40 farms with more than 400 inhabitants. I mean, that the impact of that eruption is, is uh, uh, evident in the fact that before this eruption, the name of the volcano or the glacier that caps the volcano is Knappafellsjökull. 
and the name of the district, the farm district, which mm-hmm. is there, was Litlajera, which means the, the, the small prosperous farming area. Mm-hmm. After the event, the name of the glacier is Öravajökull, and the name of the district is Öravi, which means the desolated area. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is the only eruption that I know of in, in Icelandic history that has changed the name mm-hmm. of a volcano and the district. So that's, a, I think, a clear sign of, of, of what kind of event that was. And the unfortunate thing, and one of the most dangerous volcanoes in Iceland, even though it's not because it erupts very frequently, but because of its location, that's Snæfellsjökull, which is opposite you know, the bay here in Reykjavik. Mm-hmm. And if that erupts, recently big eruption with with the uh, pyroclastic flows going into the sea, we could have a tidal wave generated and that would reach Reykjavik area in a very short period of time. But Snæfell Jökull is sleeping for all intents and purposes. He's, he's, he's sleeping right now, but it, it, it could wake up very quickly. When, when was the last time that Snæfell Jökull erupted? 1800 years ago, which is... And what kind of cycle had it been on before that? That's hard to say, but it's uh, so every two two thousand five hundred years or so. Okay. So maybe we have extra seven hundred years to wait, but I don't know. Start started this video trying to calm nerves, and we're not ending on a good turn right now. Oh. So, well, I mean, this, okay, this is not said to, to scare people, but also yeah. just to realize. Oh, it's the that, reality of the situation. Yes, of and, course. We, and we have to be aware. I mean, it the the likelihood of it happening in our lifetime is really, really, mm-hmm. really small. And if it did, we would be very, very unlucky. Mm. I mean, at, at least that's the way I would look at it. Say that, you know, why did that have to happen when I was there? Mm. But uh, it is there, and it can become active again. It's considered to be an active volcano, and they've done some seismic studies of it, and there is something moving underneath that volcano. Okay. Uh, and so we can't, we cannot ignore it. I mean that you know that's not a solution, mm. but we shouldn't have no panic. Right. Because, you know, like I said, the chances of this happening are so slim. But just be aware of it and make sure that you know we have something in place that at least will give us a warning. So if if, if it's happening, we go like, okay, guys, let's move up. Mm. You know, go to the second floor and stay there. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's you know, it's, it, that's how, what kind of event it would be. It's not going to be an event that would flatten everything in Reykjavik. Right. It, the low-lying areas would probably get inundated with water. Okay. But, but this is my point: is that we live on an, basically on an active volcano, if, mm-hmm. you, if you like. I mean, Iceland is just one big volcano. You can't ignore that. You have to learn to live with it and do the best and make sure that. You do what you can do in terms of minimizing the impact of this activity on on society, uh, life in general, and, and and other infrastructure. So you just said Iceland is on a very active volcanic area, and that sets us up for a question then from Daniel Thomas, who says Iceland is all caps a volcano. Iceland is sitting on a tectonic plate, why is any of this making news now? Just because? People like... Uh, uh, well, they like volcanoes, number one. They like mm-hmm. eruptions, number two. But uh, it is newsworthy when, when, when you know, people's lives get turned upside down. It doesn't matter whether it is through events like what we've seen in, in, in Svartsenki and Grindavik area, mm. or if we look at uh, the West Bank and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and Gaza Strip, and that's, or Ukraine. Uh, we like learning about those things, mm-hmm. I guess, and, uh, and follow them, see how they go. It's our curiosity. And it, He's right. In a way, you know, having a volcanic eruption in Iceland is not news mm. because we get one every three years or so, mm-hmm. on average. But 
there's nothing about. I mean, I can see them watching the eruption, and, and before I know it, it's like you know, well, oh, I've been here for ten hours, mm -hmm. and you don't even notice the time pass. It's just it's mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. oh, I agree. And listening to it, the sound they make mm -hmm. is just oh, absolutely and then, amazing and, yeah. and surprising. I think. And I guess it's also it's you know quite amazing to see how the Earth works, mm -hmm. and and realizing the forces that are at, uh, you know at play. And it, it's so much bigger than that. I, mean, I remember when, uh, in the 21 eruption, I uh, did this helicopter flight with, uh, to my mom out there and my brother, just to see it. Mm. And uh, uh, so it's a you know commercial tourist flight, and uh, we went out there and we could land reasonably close by. And my brother had heard this in the news the whole time. That's such a small even. It's such a small even. Mm -hmm. And and he came out and walked out and said, "Is this a small event?" <laughs> so he's yeah. not he's not a volcanologist no, no, as well. No, 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 no. Okay. No, no. And uh, see, that's it. It is you know, low intensity. We, we that's the way we talk, right? Mm -hmm. But when you you know you put the human scale next to it, it's big. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what nature is. It's it's big. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last question from our audience is from Volcano Groupie, and they ask, what is one question that no one has asked you about the situation that you wish someone would ask you? Mm. Or is there something that we haven't covered today, I suppose, that you, that you we, feel we, needs to be said? We, we've covered... Um most of the things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. It's 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 a hard one, but one thing that I think is is very important uh, uh, in a society that lives in this proximity to volcanoes or or even any other kind of natural uh, phenomena that can pose dangers off and on, mm -hmm. is uh, uh, the people's perception. And at any one time, the perception changes with, with you know, with as, as, as time changes and, and the conditions and all that changes. But the perception is still very important, and it's important that communities live in, you know, unity and harmony with these kind of... A, uh, uh, natural phenomena, you know, have the best perception towards the thing, in, 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 and by that I mean that they understand the events. They have reasonably good ideas how to respond if something happens, and basically are prepared and, and maybe above all respect it mm. uh, and don't ignore it. All right. Well, thank you so much You're for welcome. taking the time to answer all these questions today. I hope our audience on YouTube and on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and everywhere else for sharing this also appreciates Dr. Thorvalder taking the time today to answer your questions. Uh, and we will, of course, keep you updated yep. and maybe check back in with you, Thorvalder, if and when the situation changes. Always welcome and, and thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of viewers have been asking how they can support Iceland in the situation. So down in the video description, you'll find links to support the Icelandic Red Cross and to support the Icelandic search and rescue teams, which are all volunteer operated. Uh, if you'd like to support us at the Reykjavik Grapevine and our ongoing coverage of this situation and all things Iceland life and culture, uh, you'll also find a link in the description to join our High Five Club on SETI or support us by shopping in the Grapevine store where we have a curated lava box filled with all kinds of volcanic goodies and then books on Iceland's volcanic activity and geology. Thanks again for watching. I'm Catherine Fulton for the Reykjavik Grapevine. Until next time.